Okay, I guess uh, we can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is John Coonrod with Rogers Corporation. I'm going to talk about uh, several different studies that we've done over the last uh, year and even more recently. And um, what it is is really a comparison between microstrip transmission line and also ground to coat planar transmission lines. And it's showing some comparisons of why you'd use one over another. A lot of times it's frequency related and it can be other issues as well. But also I'm going to uh, talk about some of the fabrication issues and the variables associated with fabrication on each one of these structures. So to begin with, I'll go through a brief introduction of uh, these two different structures. They are a PCB-based type of uh, construction. So PCB being a printed circuit board, uh, the microstrip, as you're all probably pretty aware, is just a simple signal conductor over a ground plane. And uh, the ground to coplanar waveguide is also a two copper layer circuit that's just uh, ground plane on the bottom. And then on the top layer, it is a coplanar layer of ground signal ground. And the grounds on the top layer are tied to the ground to the bottom by uh, plated through old vias, of course. And uh, both of these uh, circuits are usually not uh, implemented in the form shown here. It's usually part of a multilayer anymore. And today's circuits are usually multilayer. And these uh, circuits are typically part of the top or bottom layer of a multilayer. But for what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to keep it simple and just refer to them as a two copper layer circuit. So a brief uh, comparison, and this is actually subjective and, you know, it's kind of a, a relative thing, but a brief comparison between the microstrip and the grounded coplanar waveguide is that the, uh, they both have the same uh, propagation mode, and that's a quasi-TEM wave. And uh, some of the reason there is because uh, the wave itself, as it propagates on the circuit, is uh, the fields are used in air and also the substrate both. And because of that, you can't get a pure TEM wave. You get a quasi-TEM wave. And the air also um, causes some issues with dispersion and uh, some other effects as well. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then uh, there's also comparisons for capable bandwidth. Again, this is kind of subjective and it's a, a reference. But in general, microstrip is uh, limited in bandwidth compared to grounded coplanar waveguide, or I should say grounded coplanar waveguide. You can typically get a wider bandwidth out of it, uh, depending on what you do, of course. And then the uh, impedance range, typically you can get a wider impedance range out of a grounded coplanar waveguide than a microstrip. And that's simply because of the uh, different variables you have in the grounded coplanar design to vary the impedance. And then dispersion, uh, microstrip is a dispersive medium, and ground to coplanar waveguide, if it's designed correctly, uh, is very low in dispersion. Actually, if it's designed to optimum, even at pretty high frequencies, you can have very little dispersion. And then when you get into the millimeter wave uh, range of frequencies, dispersion is definitely an important issue. Uh, but radiation loss and spurious modes are usually two issues that pop up a lot. And to deal with that, uh, microstrip's a little more difficult with the spurious modes. Again, you don't have a lot of freedom in the design. As you do with the ground to coplanar waveguide, you have more things in the design that you can move around and adjust to uh, affect these spurious modes for suppression of them. And for radiation loss, microstrip is usually more lossy for radiation loss than ground to coplanar. And again, this is generalization. That depends on a lot of stuff. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some uh, variables as it relates to printed circuit board fabrication of either one of these, uh, of both of these structures, and showing that uh, actually microstrip is less impacted by some of the variables in printed circuit board fabrication as compared to a grounded coplanar waveguide. And um, to begin with, uh, before we get into that, it's good to think about the fields. So as we talk about some of these influences of fabrication related to these structures, understanding how the fields behave is really a, a good basis for it. And uh, microstrip is, um, I have shown here, both these drawings are kind of uh, very basic and they're not drawn real rigorously, so uh, bear with me. But it, they do pretty much show the basics that I'm trying to show. And in the case of microstrip, you have a strong concentration of fields between the signal plane and the ground plane. Uh, and also on microstrip, you have a uh, concentration of fields at the corners and also current density at the corners is higher too. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Then for the ground to coplanar waveguide, um, that's similar in some ways where you are using air, the fields are using air somewhat. And uh, the signal between the signal and the ground plane, whoops, between the signal and the ground plane, there's fields there, but they're not quite as strong as they would be in the microstrip because you have other neighboring fields on the coplanar layer between the signal layer and the uh, adjacent ground planes. Now sometimes when it's a very tight space between the signal and the adjacent ground planes, uh, that's tightly coupled, and because of that, you have more electric fields between there. And uh, when you do that, sometimes they, they do this purposely to minimize radiation at higher frequencies, and also it helps um, minimize the spurious modes at higher frequencies as well. 
So uh, this slide and the next few slides is kind of a summary of one of the studies we did that's uh, interesting. And what we did was uh, we used the same sheet of material and we cut it in half. Half the circuits made on one material were purposely plated to a higher copper. The other half of the panel was plated with thinner copper. So it's the exact same panel, just with thick and thinner copper. And the circuits were the same on both of them, microstrip, and I also had ground to coplanar waveguides. Some were tightly coupled, moderate coupled, and loosely coupled. And then we looked at several different uh, properties. And one thing that we noticed was on microstrip, when you looked at thin copper versus thick copper, we didn't see a lot of difference. We did see some difference, but it didn't really jump out at us like the ground to coplanar waveguide did. So in the case of microstrip, when we looked at thin versus thick, the thicker copper circuits had a slight decrease in the uh, effective dielectric constant, a slight increase in the impedance, and also a little bit of a benefit for insertion loss. Now the insertion loss, to be honest, that was eh, not a big difference. It was some difference, but not. it was one of those things we had to measure multiple times because there was a difference, there was a trend. And I think the reason I, I believe this to be true is really back on the fields that if you have thicker copper, now the signal conductor is actually taller, basically. Now you have more fields in the air, and air is the lowest, mo lowest loss medium you can have. It's also the lowest dielectric constant, so it can affect the effective dielectric constant. Um, and then back to uh, looking at the ground to coplanar waveguide circuits. Uh, what we did was we looked at thin versus thick again, and these are micro sections of the circuits we used. What we had the thinner circuit, the copper is only about one mil thick, and the thicker copper circuit about four mils thick. It's using the same material, it's 10 mil 4350B, same circuit design. And uh, what we found was the thicker circuits had a definite increase in the effective dielectric constant, but it depended on several things. And I'll show you that in a slide. So if you think about this and think about the fields I talked about earlier, uh, what would you think of as a, a ground to coplanar waveguide that is tightly coupled, so you have very uh, tight space between the coplanar signal and the neighboring ground planes. That means you have a lot of electric fields in there. And also if you have thick copper plating, that means the sidewalls of the signal conductor and the neighboring ground conductor are very tall, so now you have more fields. So basically you're using a lot more air, or the fields are using more air, one way to think about it of this structure. So a structure that is tightly coupled with the copper is having fields more in the air. And because of that, the effective dielectric constant is going to lower, which it did actually. So the lowest circuit for effective dielectric constant is the green curve. And my nomenclature there is W18S6. And what that means is the conductor width was 18 and the space was 6 mil space. And that's actually this circuit here, where the conductor width measured at the base is 18 mils wide and the space was 6 mils wide. And um, you can see that is the one that had the lowest effective dielectric constant because, again, the fields are using air more dominantly. Now, if you go to the flip side of this and look at the ground to coplanar waveguide that is uh, a much wider space, loosely coupled, and thinner copper, that's this circuit in red. And the circuit in red here is W21S12, a 12 mil wide space. It's a wide space, loosely coupled, and also it's thin copper. And that means that the sidewalls between the signal and the neighboring grounds are, are thinner and you don't have as much interaction with the air. Now, again, this is using the exact same material. So we took a panel, cut it in half. One, one panel, one sub panel was uh, used to make the thin circuits, one sub panel for the thick circuits to minimize the uh, material effects. And you can see there's about a 0.3 difference in the effective dielectric constant, which is actually pretty significant. And uh, then we looked at insertion loss. And we did uh, the same type of evaluation, looking at insertion loss. And if you think about this, uh, a wider conductor generally means a lower conductor loss and uh, inherently lower insertion loss. And uh, that combined with a, uh, a uh, design where you have a, um, the conductor walls are actually taller, or basically the copper, the copper is plated thicker, now you have more use of the error, and error is the lowest loss medium there is. So really the circuits that perform best for insertion loss are the circuits that had the widest conductor and actually the, um, the thickest copper. So that kind of makes sense if you think again about the fields. So the, the copper walls are much taller. You have more air being used. Air is the lowest loss medium. Also the conductor width was wider, so you have less conductor loss. And then on the flip side, you can see that the, the circuit with the higher loss was the W18S6. It's got the more narrow conductor, and also that's the one with the thinner copper. So again, less fields being used in the air. So now there's an ENIG influence. Now ENIG, I talk about this pretty often, and some people think I'm bashing ENIG. ENIG's actually a really good finish, but it just has something inherent in it, and that is nickel, and nickel is about one-third the conductivity of copper, 
And because of that, when you add ENIG to a circuit, you're adding to the conductor losses. And um, really, this is showing a difference between how microstrip performs and how a tightly coupled grounded coplanar waveguide performs when comparing bare copper to ENIG. Now, some people ask me, why does the bare copper versus ENIG, why does the loss actually happen in a microstrip? And the reason why, because uh, a lot of times you're thinking most of the fields are between the signal plane and the ground plane, which they are. But again, there is a concentration of fields at the corners on the, uh, the microstrip circuit, or a concentration of current density at the corners. And that's actually where the ENIG is picking up uh, or causing more losses, really. Now, in the case of the grounded coplanar waveguide, there's something different going on. And in that case, you actually have very strong fields between the signal plane and the neighboring ground planes. And those fields are actually using four layers of ENIG then. And again, nickel being more lossy, you're going to have more loss that way. So you can see in this comparison, going out to about 50 gigahertz on the same material, 8 mil 4003, microstrip for bare copper versus ENIG, about a 0.5 dB per inch difference. And then the grounded coplanar waveguide, which is, by the way, tightly coupled, and it does make a difference. There's about a 1.2 dB per inch difference or so at 50 gigahertz. And uh, then following with the same thought process, uh, looking at loosely coupled versus tightly coupled for a grounded coplanar waveguide, loosely coupled having less fields uh, between the signal and the ground plane, less, uh, inter less current density at the sidewalls between the signal and the neighboring ground plane. So the loosely coupled, you can see there's a difference of uh, the bare copper versus ENIG, but it's not as dramatic as the circuits that are tightly coupled. There's a much bigger difference. And again, thinking about the fields and how these structures are using the fields, that kind of makes sense. So as a, a quick summary, uh, some of the trade-offs between microstrip and grounded coplanar waveguide, microstrip seems to be less influenced in electrical performance at high frequency uh, as it relates to uh, fabrication variables, or the fabrication variables we looked at here. Um, and also, another thing to think about is microstrip is actually more prone to differences in the copper surface roughness that's between the substrate and the copper as we make the laminate, as compared to a ground to coplanar waveguide. So in the case of a ground to coplanar waveguide, you have less fields between the signal plane and the ground plane. In the microstrip, you have a lot of fields between the signal plane and the ground plane. And now the copper roughness, whether it's rough or smooth, that's a lot more impactful on the microstrip than the ground to coplanar waveguide. Then plated finishes, where I talked about that, and uh, then some general observations. Uh, in general, uh, as you look at different frequencies, microstrip is usually less lossy than grounded coplanar at the microwave range. As you get higher in frequencies, a lot of time microstrip is more lossy than grounded coplanar, and a lot of that's due at the higher frequencies. Microstrip is picking up radiation loss, and if the grounded coplanar is designed properly, it doesn't have as much. And then there's some other issues too, looking at uh, dispersion where the microstrip is more dispersive than the grounded coplanar, and uh, also mode suppression when you get in the millimeter wave range that used to gets to be a little bit more important as well. So I buzzed through that pretty quick, but I think I have a minute or two for questions if anyone has any. Yes, ma'am. Um, for ground or coplanar waveguide, did you find that via geometry impacts performance? And what I mean by that is like via diameter, the spacing between vias, and spacing from the edge of the ground plane? Yeah, that's a really good question, and that's definitely true. And I didn't probably draw this right. If I could ideally put in the vias, I'd put, I'd put the vias in right along the edge of that if I could. But it seems like as you move the, the vias back farther, uh, what I think is happening, you get uh, a change in loss and a change in impedance, and I think you're picking up more parasitic parallel plate inductance, I think. Uh, I wouldn't be the expert on that one, but that, I have seen the difference that as these uh, vias are moved farther away from that interface between the signal and the ground plane, you do pick up more losses and impedance actually increases a little bit. That's from limited studies. Uh, and then the pitch from via to via, we usually, uh, sorry, the pitch from via to via, we usually want to think of like one-tenth wavelength, and that's really safe for the highest frequency you're operating on. Uh, I think textbook-wise, probably one quarter, but usually one-eighth is good or one-tenth is really safe. Did that answer? Okay. Thanks. I got 40 seconds. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what other finishes would I suggest other than ENIG? ENIG's a good finish, like I said before, but it is more lossy, of course. Uh, Immersion Silver would probably be the one I'd go to, and every finish has their pros and cons, of course, and I'm not real good at all these different finishes. I am doing a study looking at Immersion 10, Immersion Silver, Pig, ENIG, and a bunch of them at millimeter wave frequencies, so I'm going to learn more here before too long.
but silver would be my gut fill. Be a diameter? Uh, I haven't done a study on that. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Yeah, sorry, I ran out of time. <laughs> Thanks.